Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's Senate Occasional Lecture. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land and paying respect to all Indigenous elders past and present. Now, today we have a great treat for you because we have someone practised in not just one, but three dark arts. Not only is uh, Alex uh, uh, involved in polling at the moment, but in uh, previous aspects of her career, she's also been involved in, in intellectual property law and uh, in advertising. So I think she's a very good person to speak to us today about um, whether Australians are disenchanted with democracy. Alex Oliver is currently with the Lowy Institute, where she's director of polling and, uh, and uh, she's a research fellow at the Institute. She has particular interests in uh, foreign policy and public opinion, and um, she has research interests in such uh, subjects as Australia's diplomatic infrastructure, consular affairs, Australian and international public diplomacy, and leadership in Asia. She's a published author and uh, a very accomplished person, and I invite you to welcome Alex Oliver today to talk to us about Australian democracy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lang, Clerk of the Senate, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'll try not to be too dark, we'll lighten it up a little bit with the arts. Um, this week is a very interesting week to be talking about democracy. There are popular uprisings in the U Ukraine, Russia's dramatic incursions into Crimea, anti-government protests in Thailand, Turkey's democratisation process falters with a deepening corruption scandal engulfing its Prime Minister. Cambodia's post-election strife still simmers with protests suppressed and human rights trampled. Egypt's early attempts at democracy have proved an abject failure. This all sounds very far removed from Australia and geographically, of course, they are. But they are examples of democracy under fire and faltering. And that's where Australia incredibly comes in. Over the next few minutes, I'll attempt to explain why. The Lowy Institute has been conducting public opinion polls on foreign policy issues for a decade, and this year we will publish our 10th annual Lowy Institute poll. Over the years, I and former poll directors have asked hundreds of questions of Australians of all ages, from all states and all walks of life. We've asked questions about the international economy, about climate change, important relationships with nations like Indonesia, China, the US, and attitudes to the rise of Asia. We've asked about the sorts of issues which Australians see as threats to this nation from climate change to terrorism, among others. We've asked about Australians' use of media in a rapidly changing media environment and about hotly debated issues like asylum seekers and foreign investment. But one of the most thought-provoking findings from all of our decade-long polling has been on Australians' attitudes towards democracy. These findings came almost by accident. We'd been conducting opinion polls in some of the other nations in our region, such as Indonesia, Fiji, Fiji and most in recently India. In each of these countries, we asked a different range of questions, depending on the particular national and bilateral context. One common question, however, was one which had asked, been, been asked in other countries by a respected US polling organisation, the Pew Research Centre, which has been conducting multi-nation opinion polls since the early 1990s. The Pew democracy question asked people to choose which statement most closely matched their own opinion. The first option was, and I'm sorry if you can't read this with the light, democracy is preferable to any other kind of government. The second was, in some circumstances, a non-democratic government can be preferable. And the final option was, for someone like me, it doesn't matter what kind of government we have. Our former poll director, Fergus Hansen, included this democracy question in three separate Lowy Institute polls in 2011 and 12 in Fiji, Indonesia and India. And you can see from these charts, the results were markedly different across the three countries. Support for democracy in Fiji under the undemocratic Banyamarama regime was surprisingly slim. In India, with an older and more robust democracy, it was significantly stronger. Fergus and we found these results intriguing and decided to include the democracy question in the 2012 Australian poll. My guess is that he assumed that the results in Australia would be considerably different in a nation whose Western democratic traditions go back to the beginning of the last century. The results were surprising and confronting. 
in the circled area there, you can see that Australians were less supportive of democracy than people in India, which is a newer democracy than ours, and Indonesia, an emerging democracy, and ahead, and ahead of only Fiji, not a democracy at all. Only 60% of Australians of voting age said that democracy is preferable to any other kind of government. Nearly a quarter said that in some circumstances, a non-democratic government could be preferable. 15% said it didn't matter what kind of government we have. Even more challenging was the response of the younger age group, the 18 to 29 year olds. Only 39% of them felt that democracy was the most preferable form of government. More than half either didn't care or thought a non-democratic system might work better. Of course, these results were controversial. They generated a good deal of discussion among the commentariat, not all of it positive. Some thought our results couldn't possibly be right, that they must be some sort of statistical skew in our survey, that we were asking the wrong question, or that the context of the poll caused people to misunderstand the question. So just to be sure, we asked exactly the same question last year. This time, only 59% of all adults said that democracy was preferable to any other kind of government. And as for the younger age group, the 18 to 29s, whose responses were so surprising the year before, whoops, here they are. Less than half of these Gen Ys thought that democracy was preferable, and almost half, if you add the top two boxes there on the right-hand column, thought that it didn't matter or that a non-democratic system might work better. Australians under 30 and over 30 put very different values on democracy. Our findings were that Gen Y, if you'll let me use that label, which roughly aligns with the 18 to 29 year old age group, were significantly less committed to democracy than their peers in India, in Indonesia, and about as enthusiastic as Fijian young people were about democracy. In India, for example, 71% of young people thought democracy was the prefer preferable form of government. That's compared with 48% of young Australians. 71, 48. That's a dramatic statistical difference. In Indonesia, the comparison was almost as striking, with two thirds of young people saying democracy was very important, compared with less than half of young Australians. These findings don't stand alone as isolated results in our polls. In our 2011 and 2012 polls, we asked in all four countries, Australia, Indonesia, India, Fiji, about the attractiveness of other Western liberal values, like the right to a media free from censorship, the right to freely express oneself, the right to a fair trial, and the right to vote in national elections. All of those rights were highly valued in all four countries. 90% of Australians strongly agreed with the importance of the right to vote in elections. So why the difference? Do Australians not equate the right to vote with the principles of democracy? The results posed other big questions. Why do such a large proportion of Australians, whether young or old, 40% of them, not seem to value democracy as the most preferable form of government? Is it a phenomenon just in Australia? Or are the democracies in other countries facing similarly existential questions with a waning interest in the democratic ideal? And if so, why? And what could be done? As luck would have it, I am backed up this week by no less than The Economist in a six-page cover article on what afflicts democracy worldwide. I'll get back to their excellent argument later. But in the meantime, it's a little short on detailed evidence behind the theory, and there's quite a bit of evidence to be found. So I wanted to start with some research in other countries on support for democracy. A large study in Canada in 2012 surveyed 1,500 Canadians on democracy and governance as part of a very significant survey of 26 nations and 41,000 people across the Americas. So in a format very similar to our own question on democracy, Canadians were given the statement, democracy may have its problems, but it is better than any other form of government. In 2012, only 61% agreed or strongly agreed with that proposition, which was almost exactly the same number as those who chose the similar statement posed in our Australian polling. Interestingly, less than 50% of young Canadians, those under 30, agreed that democracy was better than any other form of government. Again, a result very similar to our own. And in another very nice piece of timing for me, the United Nations last week released the results of what is thought to be the largest global survey ever conducted by the UN Millennium Campaign, the UNDP and the Overseas Development Institute, among others. The survey asked people to choose six factors out of a possible 16 which would improve their lives and those of their families. 1.4 million people have already responded to this. 
Overwhelmingly, the results show that people want a good education. That's unsurprising. They also prioritise better health care and better job opportunities. The fourth highest response was for an honest and responsive government. However, political freedoms came third last of the 16 factors which people thought would improve their lives. So this suggests the same sort of disconnect between freedoms and democratic government, which we've seen in our Australian polling. The link seems to be missing between the concepts of good government, democracy and political freedoms. The proposition that it is difficult to have one of these without the others seems to have escaped not only Australians, but their counterparts around the world. So what's behind this perplexingly low level of support for democracy? When we released our results in 2012, there was considerable conjecture about the reasons. Some of the theories were advanced that were advanced were these. Firstly, that democracy has become the victim of its own success. It's taken for granted by a Cold War, post-Cold War generation, which has never witnessed any serious ideological competition to democracy. The second um, hypothesis was that political freedoms are shunted behind other priorities in a capitalist and consumerist society. Thirdly, that nations with different political systems, particularly in our region, are seen as successful despite being non-democratic and present a somewhat viable, even attractive, alternative to our imperfect democratic system. Next, that Australians, and particularly young Australians, are increasingly being turned off by the tone of political discourse in Australia. And finally, that civics education was lacking in our schools today, or that it fails to engage younger generations in conversations about the democratic system in all its glorious imperfection. I'm going to take each of these hypotheses and examine them one by one, but I'll deal with a couple quickly before getting to the thorny ones at the end. Firstly, the idea posed by a policy analyst at the Centre for Independent Studies. In the middle of this picture is a young lad asleep in the middle of what I care to call a civics lecture. <coughs> he was responding to our first poll results in 2012, and he advanced this intriguing theory that the democracy is actually the victim of its own success, that it's undervalued precisely because it's flourishing worldwide and has effectively prevailed over its ideological adversaries. So this is worth looking at. Is democracy such a standard model for development, so much the norm, that it's being taken for granted? Has it lost its gloss and become, as Herskovich argues, an almost mundane and commonplace political institution? The work of Freedom House suggests that democracy is indeed becoming the norm worldwide. This comes from Freedom House's annual Freedom in the World Index. Um, Freedom House has charted the spread of democracy since 1972. In the 40 years between 1972 and 2012, the number of free countries, they're the green ones on this map, in the world more than doubled. So that now 90 of the 200 odd nations of the world are ranked as genuinely free. Those with broad scope for open political competition, a climate of respect for civil liberties, significant independent civic life and an independent media. And as a proportion of the world's nations, free countries have also increased significantly. In 2012, the number of electoral democracies stood at 118 of 195 countries, surveyed or more than half of the world's nations. So the argument is that this thriving democracy is more valid explanation than other simplistic arguments such as capitalism or increasing consumerism or Gen Y flippancy. Much of the world's adult population has not experienced world wars or the Cold War, but what they did see was the collapse of the Soviet Union and the victory of democracy over Marxism and authoritarianism there. So for these younger generations, democracy is seen as a given, so the theory goes. To the second possible reason. It may seem over, overly simplistic, but it's been raised by academics, commentators and politicians around the Western world. The argument for this theory is that our materialistic society, thriving on capitalism and consumerism, has raised generations born in unprecedented prosperity, generations which see themselves as investors and consumers primarily. So it's easy to imagine Gen Y growing up with myriad gadgets and iPhones and Xbox and Game Boys and Wii distracted from a focus on civil and political freedoms. In 2012, a gender-bending model named Jeffrey Starr posted a status update on his Facebook page which read, we live in a world where losing your phone is more dramatic than losing your virginity. This generated more than a million Facebook likes. I'm being facetious, of course, but one wonders where losing your vote would fall within this hierarchy of disasters for the Facebook generation. <coughs> 
So here is the third possible reason for these ambiguous feelings about democracy. After our poll was released in 2012, a journalist interviewed students at Melbourne University about why their generation seemed dismissive of democracy. One of these students suggested that, well, China is a society and a state that functions without democracy, so is it bad? You can't judge it just because it's non-democratic. It's whatever works for that culture. So this was thought provoking for me. In our region, we have examples of what appear to be successful non-democracies, such as Singapore and China. Both are economic powerhouses which have transformed themselves within the space of a generation. So is it possible that we are witnessing a generation who are aware of these different political systems and their successes, and who are consequently less wedded to the ideal of democracy as the only viable form of government for a successful nation? And how did they define that success? Is it primarily in economic terms? And so I refer you back to the second hypothesis. The next possible factor raised directly in response to our poll results by seasoned stalwarts like Laurie Oakes was that the tone of today's political discourse has significantly worsened and turned people off politics completely. Senator John Faulkner has spoken of the corrosive effect on our democracy of the increasing distrust of politicians and the increasing cynicism of politicians. He refers to cases from his own side of politics like that of Peter Slipper and Craig Thompson. Two examples of events over the last couple of years illustrate the extremes of current modes of political discourse. The first, you may recognise this YouTube clip, the Prime Minister's misogyny speech in 2012, which was viewed over two and a half million times on YouTube and went viral around the world, was made possible via the internet. The second example to hit the headlines was an extremely crude mock menu created on a prehistoric era piece of paper and photocopied at a restaurant. The first episode, the misogyny speech, actually suggests quite a high level of political engagement, at least with the issue of gender and politics, which it raised. But both examples expose the political process to accusations that is too aggressively adversarial, tawdry and brutal. Because of those deep flaws, the argument goes, Australians of voting age may tune out of the political discussion and be discouraged from engaging in the democratic process, and that perhaps this is the exception to the rule that all publicity is good publicity. Just examining this possibility that it might be the tone of the political conversation that seems to be turning the nation's voters off democracy, I searched for some data on this point. And it turns out there's a great deal of data on political engagement, not only in Australia, but in other places around the world, where there are similar currents of concern about the durability of democracy when support is waning for the very institutions which uphold it. Starting here in Australia, the ANU has been conducting a longitudinal study on Australian elections since 1987, collating data actually going right back to 1967. This chart shows the extent to which a large sample of Australians on the electoral roll have followed Australian elections in the mass media since 1967. So you can see while interest in the elections fluctuates widely, there has been something of a downward trend since the late, since the late 60s, followed by a slight uptick in the last decade with a significant contribution from news found via the internet. I'm sorry my, my arrow doesn't line up there. That's the bottom line, the one that's going up, not down. Many of the other markers watch the leaders' debates, interest in the election, care who wins the election, discuss the election campaign with others, all show a similar overall downward trend since the mid-90s, although some of the markers were quite low in the early 60s and 70s as well. A different survey last year from University of Melbourne's Centre for Advancing Journalism found that Australians in 2013 felt that the tone of the de de political debate had indeed become notice noticeably worse than it was in the past. The question they were asked to generate this chart was, thinking now about the tone of political debate in Australia at the present time, would you say it is noticeably better now than it has usually been in the past, not much different? now, or is it noticeably worse now than it has usually been in the past? And as you can see from the size of the orange slice of pie, a majority of Australians think that the tone of the debate has deteriorated. In the same study, researchers probed the level of confidence of the Australian public in various civil society institutions, the federal government, the legal system, the print press, television and universities. And they asked Australians what sort of confidence they had in those institutions. In results that might vex those who work in this place, the federal government scored only equally with television and only marginally ahead of the print press. Confidence in government lag, 
significantly behind confidence in the legal system, and universities scored most highly, interestingly, in the levels of confidence. Less than a third of Australians of voting age expressed confidence in the federal government. This prompted me to investigate whether this is just a phenomenon exclusive to Australians, jaded from years of exposure to our particular brand of domestic politics, or whether it's replicated in other countries. And in fact, the findings, about, uh, the findings support, about support for democracy in other Western nations, such as Canada, suggest that diminishing levels of confidence in its institutions may, may be one of the key drivers in the erosion of support for democracy. The America survey from which I quoted earlier about questions about trust in dem democratic and civil society institutions, ranging from the church, the armed forces, the police, the justice system, parliament, right down to politicians, so while the categories and questions were different from those that you see up here, it was striking to see that the trust in national parliaments and political parties in that study languished at 30 and 40 percentage levels right at the bottom of the list of 12 institutions. In Canada, trust in political parties was at the bottom of a list of nine institutions behind even the media. In the US, when Americans were asked various questions about respect for political institutions, pride in their political system, and whether their political institutions protected basic human rights, the US registered only very bare averages on that point in comparison with other countries in the Americas. So there are echoes of the Australian phenomenon in other Western nations. There's a sense of declining levels of trust in the institutions of our democracies. The other important question raised by our findings was about the attitudes of youth. What was driving these even lower levels of support for democracy amongst young Australians? Looking for studies on youth and their trust in political and civil society institutions to complement the data that I'd found on the adults, both in Australia and overseas, I found a significant study conducted with school-aged children by the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority in 2010. It's a very big study. It surveyed about 13,000 school children in year six and year 10, and it was trying to assess the impact of civics and citizenship educational programs in Australian schools. And the results from 7,000 year six students and over 6,400 year 10 students gave a very interesting picture. At year six, the younger group, more than half of the students assessed expressed either quite a lot or complete trust in political parties, federal parliament and state and territory parliaments. There were strong levels of trust in law courts and the police. Only the media engendered little trust in a majority of these year six students. However, by the time they got to year 10, the levels of trust in those civic institutions had eroded considerably. The only institutions which reg registered significant levels of trust were the law courts and the police. Political parties were trusted very little and parliaments at both levels recorded only marginal levels of trust. And those levels of trust are consistent with the lack of confidence that Australian adults, and indeed adults in other Western nations, have in the institutions in their own countries. And so on to civics education. What's going on with it and is it one of the answers? Reacting to our 2012 poll, an editorial in the Age newspaper in Melbourne asked, uh, argued that for democracy to be su sustained, it's necessary to have a citizenry which cherishes democratic values and which comprehends what would be lost if representative institutions and the rule of law were to disappear. That editorial pointed to the poll's other findings that the Western liberal values of a right to a fair trial, the right to vote, the freedom of expression, seem to be more highly valued than the democratic system of government itself. It expressed alarm that the connection between the possession and the protection of those rights and a democratic system of government no longer seems clear to people. That those rights to vote, to a fair trial, to freedom of speech only have a secure foundation when governments are accountable to the people. And for that accountability, citizens need to participate in the democratic process. To sustain the democracy that permits that, civics, educational is fundament civics education is fundamental. Amanda Laurie, in an article in the Monthly magazine last year, argued that Australians, and particularly young Australians, hold naive and simplistic views about politics. She pointed out that the reality and the virtue of our Westminster system is that it's adversarial. It's institutionalised squabble. And we're the beneficiaries of this. The genius of our political system, she said, is that it has evolved a civilised machinery for keeping blood off the streets. It's called Parliament, and political leaders are warlords in harness. I couldn't have said it better myself. We should not have been surprised if some of the individuals in that system, like Sipper or Thompson, behave badly. Nor is it that bad behaviour of untrustworthy characters any sort of inherent flaw in the system, or the harbinger of its decline. 
Amanda wonders about those people who routinely disparage politics and politicians. Have they never sat on a company board or a committee of a sporting club or a school's parents and friends executive? What lotus land are they living in and when can I move there? Senator John Faulkner pointed out in a speech in 2012 that the politics of distrust are easy. He narrated an amusing story about the so-called birthers in the United States, or it would be funny if it weren't so awful, whose reaction to the election of Barack Obama was not to question his politics or his policies, but to undermine the very legitimacy of his election as president. In their fantasy, Barack Obama was born outside of the United States by virtue of an incredibly complicated and extensive conspiracy between the Hawaiian Department of Health, his parents and grandparents, American Customs and Immigration, Hawaiian state officials, all of whom contrived to conceal that he was actually born in Hawaii. This fantasy, it ain't funny, has taken such hold in the United States that 13% of all adults and 23% of Republican voters believe that it's actually true. Senator Faulkner is concerned at this growing trend in Western democracies for political parties to respond to defeat by denying the legitimacy of the system itself and the integrity of the democratic process as a way of deflecting their own failure and the failure of their policies to gain support in elections. What is needed is for a better informed population about the realities of living the democratic ideal, that governing means compromise and that it's never possible to achieve perfection. In November 1947, Winston Churchill, as leader of the Conservative opposition, uttered these famous words in Parliament. You've probably all heard them, but it won't stop me saying it again. No one pretends that democracy is perfect or all wise. Indeed, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except all of those forms that have been tried from time to time. It's precisely because of this inherent imperfection that civics education is important. If we're to build trust in our democratic system and the institutions which uphold it, then it's essential that we have a very realistic understanding of the way politics works and why it is imperfect, frustrating, slow and conducted by an unruly rabble of tremendously imperfect egotists. Amanda Laurie pointed out that Paul Keating must have understood this because he inaugurated a program of civics education which was ultimately implemented by the Howard government but on an optional basis. The Discovering Democracy program was found by independent evaluations not to have been used by 70% of teachers either because they weren't trained or because they didn't feel confident to use it. There has been some progress since then. Civics education is a component of the current curriculum and it's intended to be part of the new national curriculum. A 2008 national declaration on education goals for young Australians included references to democracy and participation in Australia's civic life. However, despite some civics education, the level of students' knowledge, as we saw from the, some of those charts before, is not translating into trust in government or in the political institutions. It is also not translating into a dedication to the democratic institutions which uphold our democratic society, and it's not translating into an in interest in actually participating in the political process. The implement implementation of civics programs in our educational system, therefore, needs to be done very carefully so that teachers not only understand the issues, which I'm sure they do, but also how to engage students in the democratic process and how to, importantly, manage their expectations. The evidence at the moment suggests we've got a long way to go. Does this lack of interest in the democratic system mean that young Australians are apathetic in general? Is there anything inherent in the nature of this generation that should lead us to general hand-wringing and despair? It is the way of all older generations, and I now consider myself one, to wring their hand at hands at the failings of the younger generation. But there are several studies which suggest that, contrary to popular conception, the younger generation are far from disengaged with their rapidly evolving society. Both Australian and international studies have observed young people's increasing participation in community-based or internet action on issues like the environment, human rights or ethical consumerism. The Australian Civics Assessment Study, which I referred to earlier, asked students how important they felt it was to take part in a range of activities, from activities to protect the environment, promoting human rights, learning about political issues in the media, supporting a political party, or even discussing politics. So in terms of political engagement, the results were pointing in the same direction as those from the other studies. Australian students are disengaged from the political process. They're not interested in participating, discussing, or learning about politics. Only 18% 18, 18 thought that learning about political issues in the press was important. Only 10% thought that supporting a political party was important and discussing politics was right at the bottom of the list. 
However, the study found that more than a quarter of Year 10 students thought that taking part in activities to protect the environment or to promote human rights was very important. So these findings about Australian school children and their attitudes to social and civic engagement are reinforced, reinforced by other research in other Western societies. A new study commissioned by the National Citizen Service in the UK and conducted by a respected uh, UK think tank, Demos, published just a couple of weeks ago. It looked at the defining attitudes, characteristics and aspirations of teenagers aged 14 to 17 years old today, those who are at the tail end of the Y generation and who are therefore the link between Gen Y and the next generation. Common stereotypes of teenagers and more broadly Gen Y abound, whether in the UK, the US, Europe or here. They are not positive. They have been described as at best feckless and at worst lazy and feral, apathetic, selfish, entitled whiners, narcissistic, binge drinkers, the generation who wins trophies just for turning up at sport. I imagine it sounds familiar. This Demos report goes a long way towards debunking those stereotypes. It was a very significant survey, not only of 1,000 teenagers themselves, but of 500 of their teachers and their deputy school heads. Today's British teenagers, the report finds, are less engaged with traditional politics than previous generations, but they are more likely to be engaged with social issues, both global and local, than previous generations. They are either, either as likely or more likely to volunteer for good causes and organisations. They are more or as likely to express their political opinions creatively through art, film and music. They're more likely to sign political petitions or set up their own socially motivated project. And these findings are reinforced by the Pew Research Centre in its US survey in 2012 on civic engagement in the digital age. Very complicated tables, I'm sorry about that. <coughs> but these American data suggest that young social media users actually have quite high political participation levels. The dark blue columns are the 18 to 29s and they range from 25% who might follow politicians on the social media to 33% who post linked to political stories or a high 42% who post thought on, thoughts on civic issues. Another Pew study on civic engagement of Americans in this digital age found that younger Americans are just as likely as older Americans to engage in political activities and are much more likely to be politically active on social networking sites than in other ways, such as face-to-face. -face. It won't surprise you that this generation's social activism is expressed in different ways and in different channels than in the past. And I refer, of course, to the ubiquitous social media. Just to take a quick look at the sheer numbers involved here, half of the Australian population are on Facebook, half are on YouTube. Blog sites like WordPress and Blogspot are communication vehicles for a significant number of Australians. Twitter is growing. Photo sharing sites like Tumblr and Instagram are building their user bases. Many of our children are on one or all of these. The demo study found that substantial numbers of young people use social media to become engaged in social issues. Nearly 40% had signed petitions online, almost 30% had used social media to raise awareness for a cause, and one in five had donated money online. But what is clear from the evidence is that this political conversation has failed to make an impression on this generation. Many of you might be aware of this very sobering statistic. Just before the last federal election, there were approximately half a million 18 to 24 year olds not on the electoral roll. There are only about two million Australians in that age bracket. That is, one in four 18 to 24 year olds were not involved, not even enrolled to vote. And those make up about a third of all voters of any age missing from the electoral roll. Some commentators, like Ron Fournier in The Atlantic, have warned of a brain drain in politics and the civil service as baby boomers retire and Gen Y look elsewhere to make their mark. Party membership is on the decline, both here and in other established Western democracies. As journalist Jacqueline Maley presaged before the Labor Party conference a couple of years ago, megalitres of bad coffee will be consumed, important decisions about party policy will be mostly predetermined, and Australians under the age of 30 won't care about any of it. So what are we to make of all of this? And when we have made something of it, what are we to do? Is democracy losing supporters because it's being taken for granted after decades of prosperity and a lack of serious ideological competition? Are other, more authoritarian forms of government seen as viable options, given their economic successes? Is it the tone of the debate which has turned Australians, particularly young Australians, off democracy? Or is it a failing of our education system or the context of the conversation and debate about democracy in our modern society? 
It is perhaps a combination of all of these. However, looking at the list, there are only a couple over which we have any effective prospect of control. Firstly, to disillusionment with the current level of political discourse. All the evidence suggests that there is some degree of switching off from the political discussion because the tone of the debate has deteriorated. I'm not suggesting that the tone of the debate couldn't be improved, or at least its wit. But it isn't really so different from the politics of the past. Andrew Lee, Labor MP and currently Shadow Assistant Treasurer, in a speech here on civility and democracy last year, conducted a very interesting analysis of uncivil language in Parliament. He trawled through Hansard over the decades for the number of times the particular words liar, liars, or unparliamentary were used as common and basic indicators of uncivility, incivility in the House. He found that the most uncivil years in Parliament on this basis were in the early 1950s, in the late 1970s, and the early 1990s. Today's Parliament didn't rate. Mr Lee also pointed out that Australians have never held their politicians in terribly high regard. He referred to this speech drawn from Hansard parliamentary transcripts. The standard of debate and discussion is appallingly low. The intelligence and purposefulness of those taking part is less than evident. No country deserves politicians as bad as these. That was said by one Craig McGregor MP in 1966. So there's nothing new about our respect, our lack of respect, sorry, for our modern elected representatives. Mr. Lee also referred to some of the famous political insults that he trawled up, and I've done a bit of my own research. Paul Keating likened John Hewson's performance to being flogged with warm lettuce. When Hewson asked Keating why he wouldn't call an early election, Keating replied, the answer is mate, because I want to do you slowly. Of John Howard, dumped that old desiccated coconut, Keating said, he is the greatest job and investment destroyer since the bubonic plague. Of course, neither the insults nor the wit are confined to one side of politics. Peter Costello parried with the Labor government about the thought of Labor taking power. That is enough to put me in a cold sweat. If I look tired, it is because I have thought of that in the middle of the night. John Howard had a few mild-mannered insults of his own, each way bet Kevin. Wilson Tucky called Kim Beasley a fat so-and-so. Kim Beasley said to Wilson Tucky to go and take his tablets. Politicians have always insulted each other. Some insults, like calling someone a fat so-and-so, are probably below the belt. But I'm unconvinced that it's this sort of behaviour that undermines our democracy. I think Senator Faulkner is onto something when he cites the sometimes hyperbolic criticisms of the former Labor minority government as being an illegitimate government simply by virtue of that minority, despite the fact that Australia had had 13 previous minority governments in Federation under Barton, Deakin, Watson, Reid, Fisher, Hughes, Scullin, Menzies, Fadden and Curtin. The Gillard government was simply the 14th. To me, what this points to is a need for a better civics education. So the punchline, as I was asked last night, what is the punchline to your talk, Alex? It's boring. It's about education. We need a way to explain to younger generations about the democratic system that we value, how it works, and why, by working perfectly, it will always be imperfect. About the Westminster system, separation of powers, and independent judiciary. About why other civil liberties that we value are free press, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association, right to a fair trial, are at risk if we do not have a democratic system which makes our governments accountable. The Economist article this week neatly precedes the 19th century political scientist Alexei de Tocqueville saying, democracies always look weaker than they really are. They are all confusion on the surface, but they have lots of hidden strengths. But it is also argued that if we are to compete, keep our democracies alive, they must be assiduous, assiduously nurtured when young and carefully maintained when they're mature. It's taken me an awfully long time to get back to my opening paragraph, the one about the faltering democracies in the Ukraine and Egypt and Thailand. What these examples show is that democracies with weak institutions and with populations with little understanding of the importance of those institutions are fragile and can quickly crumble. In Australia, of course, we're fortunate to have much stronger and established institutions, but they can't be taken for granted or they may weaken and falter too. The hardest part of all this will be finding ways to engage younger generations in the political debate in ways they can relate to. It'll mean talking to them in ways they can understand and in places where they can be found. And that means, among other things, the new media. Mm. The Australian Electoral Commission has finally taken the bold step of allowing online enrolment. In the five weeks before closing off enrolments before the 2013 election, 
830,000 online application en enrolment applications were received by the AEC. Online enrolment has therefore been a huge step forward in improving the electoral engage engagement of youth. One thing that hasn't improved though is the informal vote, which this year at 6% was the highest it's been in 30 years. The number of blank ballot papers not filled out at all doubled twice between the 2007 and 2013 election. This is a small indication of the much bigger task ahead for government and educators, and that is to find ways to speak to young people about the issues they care about and finding ways to link that conversation with one about democracy and political engagement. The first part isn't that hard. Young people can be found online, in volunteer groups, in social media campaigns. The hard part is bridging the gap between their preferred fora of engagement with social issues and the traditional civil and political arenas. One such bridge might be youth parliaments. While the YMCA runs youth parliaments in every state in Australia and an Indigenous one here, there's no federal parliamentary initiative that I know of that engages Australian students in federal politics. The Greens ran a pretty good policy last year, in the uh, last election, which proposed opening up federal parliament for a sitting day, one sitting day a year for a special youth question time and partnering selected youth participants with MPs and senators as mentors. Not a bad idea. The Economist put up another, using the example of the Finnish government, which has mandated that if citizens are able to garner 50,000 electronic signatures for any initiative, it must come before Parliament for review. They call it e-democracy. Another stop, a step might be to stop lamenting and berating the disengagement of this generation and start working with the good things that we know about them. It might give us more traction. In 2007, the New York Times ran the winning essay from its college essay contest. It was entitled Coming of Age in Cyberspace. It was written by a senior at an Ivy League university on the east coast of America. The young student wrote of her parents' incomprehension at her cohort's lack of rebelliousness. You'd think they would be welcoming it. At the absence of their counterculture and seeing these as signs of that generation's apathy. She argued that just because her generation of students isn't engaged in traditional modes of counterculture doesn't mean that they're not driving change. She points out that the driving force for cultural change today is the future of technology. The Y generation is the one that's driving that change, using new technologies to change the world. Her generation, though, is not given credit for that change. It's regarded as the impact of technology rather than the impact of her generation. So let's give them some credit. When you think about it, it's because Gen Y uses social media that politicians, businesses, civil society organisations, even crusty old diplomats are getting on Facebook and Twitter. Hillary Clinton even had a famous chat on Tumblr. Like it or not, the picket line has been replaced with an online petition captioned photographs and Facebook likes. The new media expert Clay Shirky wrote in the journal Foreign Affairs about harnessing the power of these tools to build civil society and the public sphere in the same way that the printing press helped the reforms of Martin Luther and pushed along the Enlightenment and nothing less than the scientific revolution. I don't have the answers, but I did want to leave you with this thought. Rather than fight these changes, we should go with them and not with a sigh of resignation or resistance, but with enthusiasm. I think we need to admire the new media as the digital town hall, a place of free assembly, community coordination and open conversation. Because embracing this generation and engaging in conversations on their terms might be the only way to preserve democracy for future generations. Thank you, Alex. There was such a lot of fascinating data in your, your talk that, that, that one hardly knows where to start. But <coughs> if, if I could uh, perhaps start with a comment while anyone else who's interested in asking a question makes their way to one of the microphones. Uh, it, it seems to me that in our system of representative democracy, there is a you know, big disconnect between the evidence that, that, that young people certainly are engaging in issues, uh, if not with the actual political process. How then do you translate that interest in issues into participation in a system of representative democracy? And one of the difficulties I think we have in Australia particularly is the stranglehold on 
you know, candidates and pre-selections and funding of candidates and, and having the capacity to get elected to, to parliament that the, the major political parties uh, um, um, have on the system. And, um, you know, clearly from the data, political parties themselves are not, um, are not rating highly amongst any, any uh, respondent group. So it seems to me that as well as being a challenge for the institutions, there's also a, a challenge to political parties if they want to remain as representatives of, of mass um, sections of the community. They also have to get in touch with uh, modern, with young people, those of us who are not baby boomers. Yeah, and well, I did try to find out about um, political party membership here in Australia, and the uh, the figures aren't easy to find. Nobody publishes them for good reason, apparently, because it's all on the way down. But it was published in the UK that only 1% of Britons are now members of political parties compared with 20% in 1950. So in half a century, um, that's a very, very big drop and should be of big concern to the major political parties here mm. in Australia, mm. is how to get students and that generation involved in political party activity. Mm. And, and that's a frightening statistic, isn't it? And I wonder whether it is because the political parties have been slow to embrace this new way of conversing with that generation. Mm. And I noticed, apropos of that, uh, a, a concerning development just in the last day or so, where it looks like uh, the people in this house are going to try and shut down the use of Twitter and social media during sessions of Parliament and the Senate. Not um, in the Senate, not Alex. In the Senate. Let me correct oh, you there. <laughs> Good job, Dr Lang. Um, so, you know, somebody made the point that, when you know, how is that going to encourage young people to participate in their democratic system if they're not talking with the same piece of machinery mm. that they want to use? Yes. Yeah, just to clarify, I understand that the House of Representatives Procedure Committee may be looking at the use of <coughs> devices um, but one party has actually already shut it down already. Yes. As a matter of yes. convention. I, I, I've read that too. I mean, what, one of the things I suppose is, a, is um, the idea of being in a, a chamber to debate, to participate in business. And if you're being wildly distracted by devices and things going ping, then it disrupts the, the, the deliberative process that's occurring. But I, I've certainly seen over the years a much greater reliance on um, um, things, things like emails, uh, Twitter comments, Facebook comments that, that make their way instantly into, into the debate. For in the Senate, for example, there might be discussions on, on the details of a bill and the participants, the senators in that debate are getting on their laptops or, or devices, they're, they're getting instant uh, feedback and suggestions, which mm. they then feed into the, the debate, which is you know, very, very exciting. But I don't want to wrap it on. Uh, we've got a question <laughs> here. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, I just, uh, I, I take your point about embracing the inevitable. So mm. I think that um, young people are, and, and increasingly older people are, are going to be using those forms of technology. One of the things that worries me about that is that there's almost a sort of superficial aspect to it, though, that, uh, and I suppose people have referred to slacktivism, that, that you can dip into an issue without really becoming genuinely involved in it. You can sign up to the e-petition or like something on Facebook, but perhaps you don't give it a great deal of thought. Perhaps you don't do anything in terms of follow-up. Do you, am I being overly pessimistic that there are risks in those types of technology being the main way that people engage with politics? Um, I, I, I think that's a very good point, and that's the way I felt about it. So when last year I gave this speech in a very contracted version of 10 minutes, um, and I've moved on a bit since then, because I am, you know, was very skeptical about the, how many characters in a tweet? 140? 140. Um, Is there a you young know, how, person who can tell? <laughs> how, could I, how could we possibly communicate anything meaningful there? But I, I've read some stuff about this, and the reaction to the printing press, the Gutenberg printing press, 500 years ago, was exactly the same. It was felt that it would trivialise it, and one of the writers who was talking about it said um, the, the, the printing press had no impact for the first 50 years, and then, in fact, more people were reading erotica in print than they were actually reading important 
religious or political treaties is like Martin Luther's writing. But it didn't lessen the impact of those important writings that benefited by virtue of the printing press. And in fact, that the development, the impact of the development of the printing press and the whole print revolution really wasn't felt for about the first hundred years. Everything seems to be going faster now. And I suspect that in this century, we've seen so much dramatic technological revolution that the impact of social media will be felt and sorted out and developed much more quickly than the printing press with its 100 year um, birth, I suppose. So I think we have some time to wait to see how all of these new media settle down, which ones are useful, which ones are discarded, which ones are uh, you know, trivial and which ones are not. But I, I was heartened by that, harking back to the print revolution where so many people were just reading gossip and erotica and not the important stuff. But that's okay because the good stuff was propagated through that medium as well. And someone was hanging on to it in libraries too. <laughs> yeah. well, now we're digitising them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, th there's one before you. Sir, would you like to go ahead? Yes. Um, uh, I'm Jerry Stoker. I'm based at Canberra University, but also have a position at uh, Southampton University in the UK. And I've been doing a lot of work on this uh, particular issue. And I absolutely agree with uh, a lot of what it is that uh, you've argued. And indeed, it is a phenomena shared within many other Western democracies, as I think a lot of your other evidence uh, shows. And I just wanted to uh, uh, add three things to the discussion. One is actually um, citizen education or civics education has been part of what's been on offer in the UK but also many European countries and uh, large parts of the Americas as well. It doesn't seem to have had any particular impact on improving particularly younger generations opinions of politics. That leads me to the second point which is when you then explore what it is that they are complaining about and you only really had the one question and that's the difficulty which is you need to explore what people imagine democracy actually is. That's why they're responding to your question uh, uh, in the way that they are, which is what they imagine democracy is, isn't what they are actually experiencing. And I think that that means that we need to have much more of a reflective discussion. It's not just a matter of explaining democracy. People are beginning to change their ideas about the way that democracy works and the way that it operates. And in work that we're actually doing with the Australian Museum of Democracy at the moment, mm. what's really fascinating is the way that young generation are both changing the way that politics is constructed, I think a point that you've already covered, but also they share amazingly with a lot of the older generations a number of reforms they'd like to see in the way that politics would be done, which is really my third and final point, which is that in a lot of discussion about this, sometimes people end up blaming the citizens. The citizens have just become too hopeless, They're, they don't, I much more want to blame the political system. There's something gone wrong with the way that politics is conducted. I don't think it is necessarily the nature of the discourse, although there's a lot of evidence to say that people actually don't like that discourse, but fundamentally people feel that they lack power in the system. And a lot of the reforms they are committed to, and we've done lots of interesting survey work about the reforms that people would like to see, are all about both giving themselves a more direct say, but also actually trying to make representative politics what it should be, which is representative. And at the moment, they don't see it as representative of them or in any way responsive to them. So I think that you've picked up on important issues, but I don't think civics is the answer. The answer is to change the way that politics works. Interesting. Uh, we should get together. <laughs> We'll, we'll go upstairs and then we'll come down to you, sir. But you better get to the microphone because lots Thank of you. people are getting there. Thank you. If I, uh, I think the speaker before me probably uh, stole a lot of my uh, points um, supporting his arguments there as somebody who is an educator in this parliament uh, where we see 96,000 students a year. There's no other parliament in the world that entertains anywhere near that number of students through education programs. Um, uh, and, and certainly the work that happens in, at the curriculum level is also of a very high standard, both at state and the proposed national level. I think uh, the clue that I see in your data that gives us a little bit of an indication that there is a, uh, a breakdown that takes place amongst young people is the evidence that you put forward that said that at year six level, 
which is the year level where most students look at civics and citizenship, we find that, in fact, they have a high level of trust for their systems of democracy, including their parliaments. Therefore, what happens in those four years between year six and year 10 that undermines their trust in, uh, in their democratic institutions and their ability to uh, feel as though they are represented in the democracy. And I think that it's rather than blame our system that is there, the education system more broadly, which can only do so much to assist people to know and understand the procedures of parliament, we must look really to society, and I include the parliament in that, to be able to set high models, good models, for uh, the standards that we expect for people's participation in, in, uh, in society and in our civic life more generally. So thank you very much for your talk as well. Thank you, Alex. Pleasure. Um, the man in the T-shirt was actually first, so we'll go to you first, and then to you, and then to the man in the oh, check shirt. Good afternoon. My name's Max Lethborg, and I'm very interested in what you're saying. But I'm wondering if um, our democracy is being eroded and replaced in some cases by xenophobia and jingoism, you know, as uh, sponsored by shock jocks and uh, the fact that we vilify people and also that corporations may in fact have a stand that to oppose democracy because democracy may not be in their best interests. Um, I'm not sure the evidence suggests that. I think maybe I could bundle all that up into sort of the tone of the political conversation, which of course is not just, doesn't just happen here in Parliament. Um, we are backing up um, our findings in the last two polls about the feelings of Australians towards democracy with some further questions this year, and we're actually just coming out of field work. So watch this space, um, because we have asked some questions which I hope will sort of try and probe into some of the reasons behind these, these negative attitudes. I hear your point about the conversation, which is more of a civic conversation in general than a political conversation in Parliament. Um, and I don't know what, I mean, I, as I said, I don't know what the answer is. I'm not convinced that it's the tone of the discussion. I lean more towards Senator Faulkner's point of view that it's, it's about, it, it must happen in the education sense. And I think perhaps the evidence about what, attitudes change, the attitude changes between year six and year 10 students suggests that education may well have a, a, a greater role to play. Um, but I hope to be able to report back to you in a couple of months time with some better sort of data on what's actually behind this. Because when we found, when we got these results in the last two years in a row, of course people were saying, what is driving this disillusionment? What are young people thinking about when less than half of them think that democracy is important? So, so we, we do have to try and find out why. I'm, I'm simply putting up some hypotheses here and, um, and I hope that we can test those hypotheses with some better evidence. Thank you. Front. Thanks. Um, my name's Catherine Moore. Uh, I'm a member of the Greens and I do believe our membership is increasing, especially with young people. Um, I was a local government councillor and my particular interest is changing the way we do politics. And thanks very much for a great talk. I, I wanted to take up a couple of things that previous speakers have said, particularly um, the issue of uh, civics education, while I thoroughly agree that it's really important, what happens after that? Because people go out and they want to participate and look at the Iraq war and what happened at the federal level. Hundreds of thousands, millions of people around the world said no, but it still happened. And at a local government level, we're seeing people say no to developments and huge numbers of people oppose them, yet their councils go ahead with them because it is um, the, the capitalism and consumerism aspect that you talked about as being you know, those other priorities, which I'd like to turn back to governments. They're being told what to do by big business. And at the moment, we're seeing disastrous consequences ahead of us with the, the current government's attitude to mining coal at a time we need to stop doing it. So I think that the media also has a big role to play. It's something that another speaker uh, spoke about. But we, as well as changing the discourse in Parliament, we need to look at having principles to guide our policies and not just make these short-term decisions, which are for profit and not looking at the future. Mm. 
Um, we, we've probably got time just for these two final, very brief comments. And the man in the check shirt, I'm afraid, is, is, is in front of you. <laughs> You'll be the last one. Do you have any, do you have any comments, uh, perhaps about, including about effectiveness, of what seems to be a growing trend of mass signatures from organisations like GetUp and Avars and so on? I don't, actually. Does anybody else? I, I remember um, thinking that online petitions were extremely ineffective, and then I was quickly corrected by um, the head of GetUp at the time, who said that it had actually had some pretty significant impact on government policy at the time. I haven't seen any um, data about that. But I suspect if the Finnish government um, is prepared to look at the policy content of a petition that got 50,000 signatures, then they think it, that it has some impact. So that was a really interesting bit of evidence there. I mean, obviously, Finland's population is a lot smaller than ours, and we'd be looking at a petition that had a lot more signatures than that. But I think some of those big online organisations like GetUp do get you know, millions of signatures to some of their initiatives, and, and that could well be um, an indication of how influential they may, you know, they may be on policy. Uh, thank Finally. you. Um, a very thought-provoking uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, just three very quick points. First, uh, is there any uh, work being done on the attitudes of the Gen Y people to democracy when they become 30 to 45 years old? In other words, do their attitudes change? Um, a second point, um, the referencing the Gutenberg comment, surely readership levels are not unrelated to literacy. Uh, and the third point regarding the uh, declining membership of political parties, surely uh, that's a reflection of the iron hand of party machines and the control over the pre-selection process. Mm -hmm. Well, which was um, Dr Lang's point, and I think that's a very valid one. I think it's something that they will need to, to look at. Mm -hmm. um, as for your Gen Y, um, they w well, obviously, but we have to wait because they're Gen Y now and they're not 30 to 40 yet. So we do have data on what over 30s think. And we do know that liberal that, that that values change as generations get older. So a younger generation, you know, what was the comment? It was com commonly attributed to Churchill, but was not actually by him. I think it was a French premier who said, "If you're not a liberal when you're 20, you have no heart, and if you're not a conservative when you're 30, you have no brain." Um, so we do know that that values change. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sure he repeated it. Um, but we, we know those liberal values change, and we know that older generations now have, um, have, uh, are much more, uh, much more adherent to the you know, ideals of democracy, because our 30, our 30 plus is much stronger. They're much more in that sort of 60, 65 per cent um, in support of democracy. But we don't know what's going to happen to this generation until they grow up. Yes. Sadly, our time is up. It's been a, a fascinating hour, and I'd like you to join me in thanking Alex Oliver for the presentation. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next time.